Okay, good morning. So today we begin lecture module four. A quick note though, we just of course completed lecture module three. So I wanna speak about the Linux labs, Linux lab three. Please understand that I'm not only trying to provide or present the necessary Linux concepts and commands, but I'm also trying to provide the methodologies that we use in our normal everyday computing. Just as an example, in 3.9 and 3.10, we require long listings. I don't ask for long listings just to see if you know how to do a long listing. I'm asking that and showing that a long listing is required to understand a link properties. Because down the road, I will not represent this. Students will be responsible for past material. So should they have a broken link, they will need to identify it, determine what is going on and why it's not working. And it's that long listing that provides that discrete information on what the link points to. So this is part of our debugging process. So again, I'm not just trying to provide the necessary Linux commands and concepts, but also the very methodologies that we employ in the field during our research, debugging, and, and the like. Okay, moving on to lecture module four. Chapter four in the textbook is, in my opinion, the easiest chapter in the textbook. And on that note, should anyone not be completely up to where we are in the Linux labs, this is a great, in fact, the last opportunity to really catch up. So please take advantage of that. Um, so we're all very familiar with input and output, and I'm not going to cover everything in the chapter. There's, there's no need when we cover keyboards, uh, touch screens. Everybody is very familiar with these technologies. So I will just kind of move over them very quickly. One thing that may not be evident, you've heard me state this before, we're IT professionals from this point forward. It's actually our responsibility to remain abreast of what is going on. It's part of our professional development. And this is actually written in the ACM, the Association for, of Computing Machinery, Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. We need to acquire and maintain professional competence. Now, why is this very important? Beyond this, beyond your education, we'll all be out there working in the field. And something may come along, your supervisor may ask you for something. You know, Do you have a solution for this issue, this problem we're having? If we haven't remained abreast of what's going on, we may be unaware that there is a ready-made solution. And other organizations will be facing the same challenge. And if they, if their IT professionals, their computer scientists have remained abreast, remained abreast of the environment, they're up and running already. They have a competitive, competitive advantage over us. So again, it's our obligation to remain abreast of what is going on. So I'm slowly going to introduce the ACM Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct with each chapter as we move forward. And we'll see how it actually applies. Recall, IT, business society, right? Anything new in IT is gonna cause changes in business and result in changes in society. And the reflexive relationship also applies. So changes in society may drive changes in business and IT. Changes in business may cause changes in society and IT as well. So we really need to remain abreast of this as well. Again, I do see something in the chat. Um, my chat screen is minimized, so I don't see it. I will answer that question after. If it's important, actually every, every question is important, please, please speak out and I'll address it because I guarantee if you have a question, someone else has that same question. So I'm going to jump to the textbook material. Now I'm gonna cover this in, in, in its entirety today. Tomorrow, we're actually going to look at emergent topics in input output, just to see what's out there. And some of it is, is just you know jaw dropping, it's amazing. So we'll take a look at that. Keyboards. I'm not gonna say anything about keyboards other than introduce an operating systems concept. And we'll start looking at this next week. Most people, you know, the general layman does not understand that when they're typing at the keyboard, say in creating a Microsoft Word document, those keystrokes are not going directly to Microsoft Word. 
they're actually going to the operating system. The operating system is determining, identifying that a key was depressed. It's going to convert it into an ASCII or Unicode character, the representation, and then pass that to Microsoft Word. It's the operating system that is the resource manager. And we'll look at that, introduce that further when we get to operating systems. Going the other direction, Microsoft Word does not refresh our displays. When someone types a character into Word, of course, it's recorded in Word. And then, of course, we see that our screens are updated. That's actually Microsoft, excuse me, Microsoft Word sending an interrupt, a message, system message, back to the operating system, and the operating system displays it for us. So we need to recognize this. We're looking at I.O. here that integrated kind of behind the scenes is a lot of operating system functionality. Okay, pointing devices, mice, pen styluses, you know, touch input. Um, I'm not gonna say anything. Everybody I, I assume has at least seen a mouse. Um, you may not have had a pen or stylus in your hand, but it's pretty intuitive what they do. They allow us to trace, draw on a screen. Um, they have great uses for specific sub-disciplines, graphic artists, things like this. Um, there is handwriting recognition. It depends on how good your handwriting is. Um, the handwriting recognition is adaptive. So it actually is using a form of AI. It's a neural network, which is, which is a sub-discipline of AI to hopefully improve, continually improve over time. My handwriting is horrific. It will never work. Um, I type more and more. I'm a computer scientist. So it really is not of any benefit to me. Touch screens, again, you know, 10 years ago, we still had students that did not have touch screen based cell phones, things of this nature. Um, increasingly, that's not the case. Um, even if students don't have a cell phone, they've seen one, we're all familiar. It's pretty intuitive on what a touch screen is and what it does, how it works. Perceptual computing. Now, again, many of some of these topics in this chapter, we're going to look at actual implementations tomorrow. I have a, quite a few videos lined up. So it's actually an interesting um, presentation. Perceptual computing is based on motion and it can be device free to where the, you know, your hands do not have a device in them. Sometimes in games now we have devices in our hands so it actually helps with the, the internal gyroscopes and where they are in relation to the body. Uh, it can be done with infrared, it can be done with lasers. Quite a few things can be used to detect the motion. It actually can even, there are even Wi-Fi security systems now that will detect motion and how a body is placed in a 3D environment. Um, we're gonna take a look at Apple. What is Apple's coming out with a new, essentially augmented reality glasses. Um, and they actually are, might be using a ring on someone's finger. Now I'm not sure you know, how many Apple devices we need all over our body. Um, because there are privacy issues too. And we, again, IT business society, we need to at least recognize and understand the privacy issues because they are growing, they are mounting. Okay, scanners, scanning, reading, digital cameras. We've already covered how images are digitized. The computer, whether it's a scanner, a cell phone, whatever, digital camera, overlays a grid, and then samples the color in each of the cells. And we know that to get higher resolutions, of course, we're going to have more cells. The grid is going to be tighter. This creates, as we presented, a bitmap or roster image. Um, there's no intelligence in those bitmapped or roster images. Recall there's, there is information, contextual information in vector-based graphics, again, which the textbook does not present. And I presented that two weeks ago. So we understand, and we've already presented this, how a scanner and cell phone work. Um, increasingly, just so we know, we are seeing the introduction, the emergence of 3D scanners. And I'll introduce this now. UPS, United Parcel Service, is actually investing heavily in 3D scanning 
and 3D printing. And you wonder why? Well, of course, UPS is a delivery service. Great. So they pick up parts from same manufacturers and deliver them. Great. But there is a time span that occurs for the shipping. So if you think about it, if it's just a, you know, some kind of part that can be printed, it would actually make sense to scan it, print it closer to where it's going, and then just deliver it that last little leg. Okay. You think about some of the remote areas in the world, Alaska, you know, Montana, places around the world, to where a part breaks, it may take, you know, even under the best conditions, five to seven days to get that part there. So if you think about the ability to 3D scan something and then print it essentially on site, it's very important. Think about this with the space station. Okay? There, there are a lot of applications that this may be beneficial. And again, UPS recognize this. They recognize that the industry, the world is changing and how do they adapt? And that's, again, that is our job. Okay, so we've covered this before, okay? Note that when we're scanning, okay, the numbers, the resolution is measured in dots per inch. Now, the textbook says this, um, again, we're treating everything the textbook says correctly, um, whether it's incorrect or just widely misleading, uh, we could debate that. So can you change, you can't change the resolution. Once you have a bit mapped or roster image, that's it. And we've seen this. If you have a picture on your phone and you continually make it larger, the edges start to look jagged, right? Because one cell is becoming four, becoming 12, 16, whatever, however you change the resolution. And we can't increase that resolution. Once it's captured, that's it. That's its maximum resolution. So the textbook saying it can be changed, you know, uh, when, it's, when the image is edited is, is completely incorrect. And we'll just leave it at that. I've written the authors on that error. They, they won't change it, or at least haven't. Digital cameras, we take it for granted, right, in our phones. I'm not gonna say anything else on that. Barcodes, barcode readers. We're very familiar with these. Increasingly, we're seeing self-checkouts in our Hannafords and Home Depots, so they're reading barcodes. Um, one of the things, though, we need to recognize is, again, that bigger picture. So what I'm focusing on now is the QR code. And by the way, the QR code now can be manipulated. You actually can put logos in here for your organization, which is kind of cool. But marketing, most people don't understand marketing goes far beyond advertising. Advertising, again, is just putting it out there. Most people think marketing and advertising are pretty much one and the same and they, they couldn't be more wrong. Marketing, the goal or focus of marketing is actually understanding the needs of the consumer. Okay, so it goes beyond just, just advertising. So if you think about general advertising, say a radio ad, you know, it's coming out every 15 minutes. Do these organizations or marketers know that someone just purchased the product because they heard the radio ad? Well, only if that radio ad has, you know, some promotional code, you know, put in mic, you know, and, and they'll know that it at least came from a particular radio station. But are many radio stations putting out that advertisement? And what about, was that ad put out at 8 a.m. and 8.30 and 9? Does that organization have any idea when the person heard that advertisement. In contrast, a QR code, you snap it with your phone, just even with your camera, and it asks you, of course, open up the link. A lot of information is captured right at that time. The time frame, the person's browser, what are they using, their platform, whether it's an iPhone or Android. And there's a lot of information there because people that have iPhones and Androids actually have different purchasing behaviors. So there's a lot of information a marketer can use. And consider again the application now, you know, in a, in a mall, Cross Gates Mall down near, down near Albany. And there's some billboard and has a QR code and people, of course, take the picture to get more information. Well, that timestamp is very revealing. You know, Monday or Tuesday at 11 a.m. Who could be in Cross Gates Monday or Tuesday at 11 a.m. 
you know, maybe not a student, at least a K through 12 student. Um, could it be a stay at home mom or dad? Okay. Or what kind of business would this person have that which would allow them to be in cross gates at 11 a.m.? Or in contrast, maybe there are a slew of hits, you know, on a Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Well, what just occurred? Of course, the schools got out. So marketers may actually identify a new population that's interested in that particular product or service that they were unaware of. And if that's the case, well, if these two people like it, maybe people like them would also like to see it. So it could actually direct further advertising and marketing activities. So there's a lot of information that can be um, discerned from QR codes. RFIDs. Well, RFIDs, just like you know, Moore's Law, Crider's Law, Metcalf's Law, the functionality keeps going up, the price keeps coming down, the size keeps shrinking as well. And there are a lot of applications. Out in California, winemakers started putting RFID tags in their, their corks of their wine bottles. So when shopping, people could put, take the wine bottle, put it in their cart, and up on the monitor would pop the wine speculator review. And of course, it would keep a tally of how much is in their cart, the price. Okay, great, great application. This will be coming to other stores, Walmart, Target, Hannaford, things like this. And of course, Walmart knows what you purchase, okay? And they contribute, especially if you check out with a card, whether it's your bank card or your credit card, they know it's you. They know your purchasing history. They are subjecting all that information to AI, machine learning. But think about a cart now. You may put items in your cart and then take them out. You never checked out, but now Walmart has even more information on us what we actually were attracted to. We didn't purchase it, but it went into our cart. So all of this can now be used by the company. And their privacy concerns. There's an example, a expensive luggage manufacturer put RFID tags into their luggage. Great, okay, you know, these people, I mean, real high end, real expensive. These people have chauffeurs, assistants to pick up their luggage. So down in the airport, of course, they're waiting for it to come around the carousel. They have an RFID reader. Oh, that's that, you know, that's my the person I'm working for. Okay. Thieves, real quickly learned of this. Well, if you're paying two thousand dollars for a suitcase, what do you think's in that suitcase? So now thieves in airports would get these RFID readers, walk around an airport. Oh, yeah, that's one of those expensive suitcases. I'm gonna nab that. Okay, so. IT business society. With each and everything we do, we need to think about how it can be subverted, how it can be abused. And it's possibilities for abuse are almost endless. Near field communications, okay? You know, the phone, being able to tap, use your phone for checkout, things of this nature. One of the things that we see too, going back on the privacy, we see people trading their privacy or convenience. We'll talk about this more, you know, the Alexas of the world, the Google, you know, all of these digital assistants that we have, Siri, that are listening to us um, because they're on, they have to be on. So they're picking up things in our speech. And many people have recently noticed that just some product will appear in their sidebar on Facebook and the advertising that they were just speaking about. These devices are listening, okay? We can't discount that. And that's, that's a serious privacy issue. Going back to the ACM Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct, again, when we cover it, we're gonna learn that it's our job to ensure people's privacy. And yet we have these things taking place where these assistants or our very phones are listening to us. So we're gonna to have, to, to have to take a look at this. Optical mark readers and optical character recognition. Optical marks are just, just that, they're recognizing marks, okay? Pretty straightforward. I will hopefully provide some advice here. I would recommend that everyone get a scanner on their phone with OCR functionality. The ability to take a picture of text and have it converted to ASCII Unicode is wonderful, especially for education. 
you're on the you're at the library, you're working on a paper, you find a great quote. Rather than typing it, take a picture and have it converted to text, and then take a picture of the textbook info or the text information, the publisher, the title, all that for your reference for your paper is just a great time saving mechanism. I, I wish I had had this in my grad school, would have saved me a lot of time, but I didn't. So I do recommend that they're free. Just you know, go on your app store or Google um, and look for a scanner with OCR and get a free one. They're just, they're out there. Okay, on that note, by the way, I said that free word. I'm just going to just re recall what I said. If something is free, you or we are the product. So yes, you know, we're getting that free scanner, but of course, whoever we got the scanner from, whatever organization, company that made it, they're, they're seeing what we're saving to. So just, just recognize that. I don't think they really care if, you know, or there's nothing there when I take pictures of computer science theory. Um, so biometric readers, biometric readers are here. We're gonna look at them in security as well. Um, and we have to, again, privacy. We have to be concerned because increasingly we're seeing facial recognition being used, okay? And that in itself isn't bothersome to me, um, except the way it's being used. Because now there's a database, of course, of our faces, and we're seeing the rise and rapid evolution of the internet of things where there are cameras everywhere. And you look at what's happening in China, okay, with the social credit system. And they're taking, they're, they're just tracking people. Um, so we need to at least be aware of it. Um, I would say concerned about it, but um, we'll look at that as well. By the way, they can also look at our facial expressions and interpret them using predictive analysis, things like this. Um, and, you know, that, that could be troubling. So they determine, you know, you're up to something with a 99% accuracy. What well, about the 1% you're not up to? You, know, you just had an expression on your face. So this is, this is you know, open for interpretation. And we'll look at this more when we, when we get to ethics, things like this. Augmented reality. Tomorrow, um, you know, the, the Apple Glass is getting real close. Um, it looks like an incredible product. Um, so augmented reality, of course, is superimposing information from our computing, our information sciences, onto the environment. It's great for navigation. It's great in certain disciplines, firefighting, heads up real-time displays, um, fighter pilots, any type of first responders, but even sports, you know, just, just working on skiing, things like this. There's some great applications in augmented reality uh, taking place, um, simulation, training. Audio input. Really, I've, I've covered this. We know how to sample digitally sample audio. Okay, I presented this, you know, how to digitize it. We need to recognize there are two distinct levels, okay? We understand speech recognition. We all have the ability to dictate to our phones now, whether they work or not, how well they work, you know, they make mistakes. And that's just understanding, looking at the, the speech, all right, detecting phonemes and, and pattern matching them well, it's likely, most likely, this is the word that was said, okay? So we see that. There is another area, it's, all, it's called natural language understanding or natural language processing. And this is actually a component or sub-discipline of, of, of AI, artificial intelligence. And I'll give you an example because there's more information, more, much more is required in natural language processing because now, what we seek is the semantic understanding, semantics is logical, semantic understanding of what was said. So they to say the entire sentence, the entire paragraph. And quite often you require more text to understand how it's semantically being used. I can give an example, you know, the glass table, okay? Or the, excuse me, better, the glass on the table. When I say the glass on the table, it's impossible for someone to determine 
if it's actually a glass sitting on a table or the tabletop itself is glass. There's no way to understand without looking at a broader context of what is being said and what is being presented. So natural language processing actually builds these semantic understanding trees, knowledge representation. And I won't get into it beyond that, but understand that speech recognitions are essentially dumb. They're just matching phonemes to try to detect what is being said. Now, with Alexa, all these digital um, assistants, they are employing AI, natural language processing, to determine the semantics of what we are saying. Okay, music input systems. Well, we know about digitizing audio, okay? There is something else that music, how music can be represented. It's the musical interface, uh, the digital interface, um, musical instrument, digital interface, MIDI. And it is, requires much less bandwidth. So rather than dig actually digitizing the audio, it will determine this note, this tone, this duration played on this instrument. So not, it, you can record a lot of information in a, in a very in a small amount of data. Display devices. Here again, I'm not going to say much. Um, we're pretty familiar with monitors, you know, touch screens, things of this nature. Um, you know, we can distinguish between color versus monochrome. I haven't seen a monochrome display in some time. Note that when we look at the resolution, we're looking at pixels. So recall from our scanners, it's dots per inch. And we're going to see later with printers, it's dots per inch. But when we look at monitors, it's pixels. So we look at or determine a monitor based on its size and aspect ratio. The size is measured diagonally from corner to corner. Um, and the aspect ratio is the horizontal and the vertical component. So 16, every 16, you know, 16 pixels to nine pixels vertically, 16 horizontal to nine vertically. So that is the ratio. Um, one of the things we do need to recognize as we see, you know, more in you know, high definition, ultra high definition, all of these things, we have to recognize what's required or what the limitation may be, because it may be streamed. Well, we'll likely have the storage space, okay? Remember, recall the major limitation on computing today is though are those interconnections. So we can see just the distinction between 720 and 1080, okay? It's 1 million versus 2 million pixels. That's doubling. That's doubling um, the amount of necessary bandwidth should something be streaming. We've covered this. Um, VGA is the real old, you know, video graphics adapter. <clears throat> Pardon me. DVI, the digital video interface. But really what we're looking at now is the high definition multimedia. So as soon as we see that M multimedia, we know we are capturing or encoding or together integrating both audio and video. So that M is that, that key letter there that really distinguishes. Okay, um, wireless displays, they're here. Um, again, entirely dependent upon the bandwidth um, that is that is available. So I won't say more on that. And again, the rest of the chapter, we're kind of going through and looking just at all the different types of display technologies. We know we've kind of evolved from LCDs to the much more energy efficient LEDs. Um, OLEDs are kind of real nice because they can be curved, but they can also be flexible. So these have great applications in mobile devices, right? Rather, you know, a screen that'll bend a little rather than just, you know, break and fracture um, is, is kind of appealing. Electronic paper. Um, the best way to present this is just through an example, the Kindle. Okay, the Kindle, of course, is black and white. The major advantage, of course, it takes very little power. So the battery life on them is very long. And it's also more readable in, you know, direct sunlight in daytime. iPads can be challenging to read in, in direct sunlight. 
There are other types, you know, interferometric modulators, um, you know, limited applications, real limited, because they're, they depend on mirrors. So of course, if there's no ambient light, you're not gonna see anything. So nighttime, they're completely useless. Um, you know, very, no, no moving. They're just very simple, very appropriate for say museums, you know, things like this, nature walks, and we'll leave it at that. Wearable and touch displays, okay? Again, great functionality. We're gonna look at quite a few of these tomorrow. Um, but again, we always have to be aware of privacy. Now, in the workplace, wearable and touch wearable displays, um, you know, for firefighters, for all these first responders, great, okay? But one of the problems that Google Glass had is now you just have an average person walking around with a camera, you know, essentially right here on their face, capturing everything. So, and it's not just them because they may not save it, but now Google was seeing everything that was going on. Um, so there, so there, again, there are privacy concerns here. So again, tomorrow we're gonna to look at the Apple Glass or Glasses. Um, this, by the way, is the video from the Microsoft HoloLens, which is wonderful. Don't, don't get me wrong. It has great applications. Um, it's expensive, $3,500, whereas the Apple Glasses are gonna come out under $500. And when we look at holographic displays, again, very closely related to augmented reality, a lot of applications. You look at say remote work or remote assistance, maybe a better example. And I'll look at the general you know, practice physician, say in Alaska, and they have to perform an emergency surgery they've never seen before. And it has to be done now, right now. The ability to put on one of these displays and see the patient work through, of course, the, the operation, but then also have assistance from say an expert in the field from Johns Hopkins or Bethesda, you know, one of the major universities, one of the major university hospitals to direct that general physician, you know, this is what you do. So you're looking at the physician and remotely, of course, the expert can say, okay, you need to cut here. You need to be aware of this. Okay. It's a wonderful application. Um, here in this video, you have someone remotely assisting someone locally to do a sink repair. So great, okay. Car repairs, you can think of all of these applications. Holographic displays and augmented reality can, can be incredible. Uh, multimedia projectors, we know projectors, okay. What really, what's really interesting is the Pico projectors. I'll show you something tomorrow, which is essentially a snap-on iPhone case and will project on a wall, even in bright light, you can actually see it very well. Essentially gives your phone the functionality of having a larger monitor. And I'll actually show you some keyboard technologies that will actually, you don't need a keyboard too. Um, so as we look at, you know, the evolution of the mobile device, you know, it has yet to supplant the desktop, the notebook computer, but with some of these add-ons, it's actually getting closer and closer. So we'll take a look at that tomorrow, the Pico projectors. Printers, I'm not going to say much about, you know, when we look at, you know, dot matrix, lasers, inkjets, and really when it comes to purchasing a printer, well, what are our needs? Are we just printing documents? Fine. Do we need the higher resolution and color for photos? Okay. But also, what is the total cost of ownership, TCO? And that's the first time I've used that term. And we'll look at that when we get to systems analysis and design, because of course, in the enterprise, we're always performing cost benefit analysis. It's not just the initial cost, it's what's the cost over the lifetime. Because inkjets, inkjet, um, you know, the printing material is actually very expensive in contrast to lasers. So a laser printer, while it may be a larger upfront cost, in the long run, it may be more cost effective because the toner cartridges are much less expensive than the inkjets. Okay, so that's printers. Again, printers, when we look at resolution, it's dots per inch, just like a scanner. And again, a monitor is pixels. Okay. So nothing more there. You know, connection options, you know, if you can go to a network type printer, 
And most printers actually today have ethernet ports on them. So you can plug it right into your router. You know, so for, I guess for a home application, you can print from any device anywhere wirelessly in your, in your house if you have a Wi-Fi router. Uh, Multifunction devices are, are nice. 3D printers. As I mentioned, you know, UPS is investing heavily in 3D scanning and 3D printing. They see what's coming, okay? Um, and with a 3D scanner, you know, it introduces a world of other problems, intellectual property rights, you know? You develop, you spend all this time developing some product and someone can come along real quickly and 3D scan it and steal that intellectual property. That's, you know, in the past, we always worried about, you know, songs being stolen, uh, programs being stolen. 3D scanners and 3D printers takes it to a new level. Um, and we'll look at that. What you can do with 3D printers today is, is amazing. I'm gonna show some things tomorrow. You can even 3D print a house. And I'll show that tomorrow. Um, audio output, you know, love my Bluetooth speakers, things like that. Um, there are other devices and the research here is really cool. There are devices that will turn any object into a speaker. So we'll look at that again tomorrow as well. So tomorrow's gonna be kind of a, a good one where we get to just relax and see what's out there. On that note, if you are aware of any new emergent input-output devices, please send them to me. I'll quickly assess them. I'll get them up on CISS100.com. And um, again, we're, we're a networked community. We need each other to remain abreast of what's going on in the environment. That's all I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Again, I see that uh, question in the chat. I'll get right there.